So um, as I said before, my name is Kristen Friedlich, and I'm from the Pennington Public Library. And today we are presenting a program on creating a backyard victory garden. Um, and the weather today, I'm sitting right by my window and it's just beautiful outside. It's a little chilly for me, but um, it was, you know, really taking a turn for spring for sure. And it has me just ready to get our home garden started. So I personally am looking forward to learning a little bit more about the history of Victory Gardens and as well as getting some tips for starting my own garden in my backyard. And hopefully you are too. Um, just a few things before we get started today. If you have any questions during the program, please write them in the Q&A section and I will relay them to our presenter. Um, all other comments or questions for me, you can feel free to place them in the chat window. Um, all right, now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Um, this is Anthony Bracco and he owns and operates Bracco Farms, a small family farm in the Black Dirt region of Pine Island, New York. He uses sustainable farming techniques to grow clean, pure produce that's a favorite among chefs. Uh, and he also teaches others, such as us, about self-sufficiency via gardening um, and farming methods. So thank you for joining us today, Anthony, and I am really excited to have you back. Okay, thank you, Kristen. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, uh, I'd like to talk about, first, a little background about myself and about our farm and how we arrived at that. Um, I've been, we've owned the farm for 13 years now. This will be our 13th season. Uh, we, we bought the farm in 2009, and our first season was 2010. Uh, we started off small, which I thought was small at the time, by doing one acre. But I realized quickly that you can really grow a lot of food, a lot of crops on one acre. So um, we uh, learned a lot on the way. Before I was um, farming, I was an avid gardener uh, for since I was a child. It's been my family comes from Europe and with a farming background. And so it was kind of, I guess, in my blood. And at some point, I always wanted to, at one point, get a farm, small farm, just to continue the legacy and to have more fun and do expand my gardening ideas. So I had a, a nice garden in, when we lived in Nutley, New Jersey. And then when I had the opportunity to buy the farm, uh, I gave up doing the gardening in uh, New Jersey, you know, my New Jersey home, because then subsequently we moved to Cedar Grove, and with all the wildlife here, it wasn't really conducive to gardening. Plus, my wife reminds me now I have the ultimate garden. So, um, so, um, and what we've done over the years, we've gotten larger. We we've farming. We had farmed at one time about seven acres, and we've scaled it back to about four, because um, once you learn how to handle tools and how to handle the land properly, you can get a lot of yield from 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 a little space. You don't need as much if you do it properly. And it's the same thing with gardening. You don't need a big garden to get a nice yield. So we came up with the original talk was the um, uh, adapting small farm methods to a backyard garden. Because one of the things I learned along the way was a lot of the tools that we use, but particularly hand tools that we use at the farm are really, really good tools to be to, uh, you can use in your garden, make your gardening a lot fun, a lot more easy, a lot um, more efficient, and these tools are no less. <clears throat> they're no, but they're un, they're not really readily available in like the box stores, Home Depots and Lowe's and such. Um, you'd have to get them from produce supply houses, and I'll give you that information now. But they're no more expensive than if you did get them there. But they're people don't know about them because they're not in the business. And what these things do, there are planters, cultivators. Uh, all types of, um, of, of uh, hand tools, small hand tools, long handle tools that can actually make the job, not a job, make it a, a much more fun experience and uh, more efficient, uh, do a lot of things like save you from bending so often, save your back, uh, help you to cultivate the land better, to manage the land better. Um, I also will share with you tonight seed sources, and these are the seed sources that I learned about um, from the other farmers and from the extension uh, farm extension service in Cornell. I never knew that any of these existed before I started farming. And I'm so glad I do now. And I'm going to share all this with you because when you have a good source for seeds, you will you will get good results and good crops and a good harvest. Um, not that there's anything wrong with burpees or anything um, or any of those seeds that you get in the garden center or in Home Depot. But a lot of these seeds are more tried and true. They're more reliable. 
they are they are they are cultivated every year, so you're always getting fresh batch. Um, none of them are GMO. They're all uh, there's no um, no like I said, there's no GMOs. They're not um, spayed with any chemicals. They're all natural. Most of them are heritage or um, heirloom varieties. So. So what I'm going to do, I divide the, the, the program into three parts. First, I'm going to show, had I been there in person, I would have these handouts that we would review that were with a lot of information on it that you can read at your leisure and you can investigate at your leisure. And then I would show a slideshow, which I'm going to do. That would be part two. And then part three is to show some of the tools. And of course, it works better in person, but it works fine on, on Zoom as well. So the first part I like to talk about is, and I will make all these uh, handouts available. I'll send everything to Kim so she can hand them to you, um, you know, give them out, and then you can keep them for your library. Um, the first thing we want to talk about is we're going to talk about uh, crops. So I'm going to share my screen first before I do anything, uh, because this way I can kind of share our screen here. Okay. And this way, when you can see when I'm opening up the PDFs, you can see everything. Uh, let's do this. Yeah, okay. Um, okay. So one of the most important things that anybody in any garden that you need to know is sun and shade. We're going to start with the crops, and we're going to talk about seed. We're going to talk about um, preparing soil, testing soil, um, till, low till. We use low till myth methods at the farm. And I'm going to share that with you too. And different types of uh, raised beds, not raised beds, open plan. Um, if you live on a slope, sometimes you have to terrace farm. So we're going to talk about all these things. But I like to start with the, the most, these crops are by no means a complete list. They are the most popular that I've found over the years, the most popular crops that people will grow in their garden. And it's particularly a victory garden. When I get to the slides, we'll talk more about what a victory garden is. Victory Garden is essentially a backyard garden, but the what, what they had done in World War I and World War II, it was just to augment your food supply so you didn't have to rely on the ration cards because most of the resources in the country are going to the war effort. So you would tend to, what they would try to tend to do is to help you to grow the most, the things that you would eat the most and would be most sustainable for your family. So I, these are the crops that I put pretty much as the crops for the Victory Garden, because they're things that we pretty much eat all the time, potatoes, squash, carrots, corn, cucumbers, eggplant, tomatoes, peppers, things of that type. So, but, and as you can see by my list here, <clears throat> um, the, those crops like full sun. So when you're thinking of siting your garden, try to site it in an area that gets at least five or six hours of sunlight a day, which is considered full sun, and this way, those crops on the left column will grow very well. Uh, partial shade is, as it says, it's, it's for crops that don't really rely uh, on heavy sunlight um, because a lot of times they're just leafy greens. So they're making a lot of leaves anyway, or the, uh, their, their root crops. So a lot of what's going on with the plant is going on below ground. And uh, so things like beets, uh, they, they need sunlight, but they don't need as much broccoli, Brussels sprouts, uh, collard greens, same thing with kale, they'll grow well in shade. They just need a few hours of sun a day. So again, cite them if you can, if you have a yard that's partially uh, full sun and partially shade, then you know where to plant the shade crops. Um, this way you maximize the sunlight for the, for the heavily uh, sun uh, crops. So what we'll do now is then I will show um, the next question that people ask me all the time is, are vegetables perennial? Um, no, most 99.9% .9 they're not perennials, they're annuals, which means you have to plant them every year. They have a, a life cycle of one season. So um, there are the exceptions to the rule, such as asparagus, which it takes a few years before you start getting asparagus, but then they come up every year. Same things with the rhubarb, certain types of radicchio, um, spinach, but certain varieties. And again, some of these varieties like the broccoli and the spinach would kind of rely on the winter not being so severe. The winter is pretty mild, then your chances of these surviving um, <clears throat> over the overwintering, as we call it, would be greater. For example, I, I don't have kale on the list here, but kale 
if the winter is mild, like the past winter was very mild, and I'd say more than 50% of our kale crops survived, and now is doing very well within the last few days with the rain and with the sunlight um, and the weather getting milder, it's all coming back. Yes, there were some fatalities, but that's to be expected. But again, had I put row covers on to protect them or, or some sort of plastic over them, maybe I could have saved the whole crop. But uh, it wasn't, you know, wasn't that important for us because I figured I can just replant it because it's an annual anyway. But we were pleasantly surprised that it um, that they uh, as much survived as it did. So then herbs, herbs, 99% of your herbs are perennials. They come up every year. So if you cut them back at the end of the season, maybe put a little mulch, a little hay around the root area uh, where the little stems are sticking out, they will survive and they will come back the next year. Uh, particularly hardy ones like oregano. In fact, our oregano survived and, and I put some straw and hay over it and the oregano is coming back very well. Uh, garlic will, depending on if you didn't pick the garlic bulb out, it will survive and make um, uh, garlic this year, but it won't make another bulb. The bulb will split into eight cloves and you'll have eight plants, but they will not be uh, bulbs. They'll just be eight individual cloves. So yes, it will overwinter. Um, things like sage, particularly parsley if it's mild, bunching onions, scallions, sh chives, they they just love the cold and they'll just survive and, and come up every year. Fruit, most of our fruit is perennial. Why? Because it's either bushes or trees. So that this way they, they survive, especially like blueberries and blackberries. If you cut them back in the fall, um, the branches cut them down as much as you can. And then in the spring, you'll get a whole new crop just shooting up and they just will expand every year. So you'd really have to keep an eye on them because they, they need to be pruned quite often. Uh, of course, grapes are peaches, pears are all that because they're trees. So that's uh, what we have with with, uh, with perennials. Then people ask me too, well, what can I do? Like, um, do I plant once a season? No, you can do mid-season planting. So I came up with a little mid-season guide. And uh, a lot of this I didn't just do on my own from my own experience. I've talked with other farmers and my farm extension agent in Cornell. In New Jersey, you would do, deal with... Um, Rutgers U University and uh, would cook college there. And I, I recommend that you go to the website and look up the Ag Extension Department and you will find there's a plenty, plenty of, of reading material and, and most of it's free on pretty much any topic, whether it be fruit trees, ornamentals, crops, whatever you need to know if there's any diseases, blights, problems you're having. And if you need to speak with an agent, there's an agent for every county. So that's good to know too. So I think you're in Mercer County, if I'm not mistaken. So you have an agent right there in Trenton, uh, you know, and I think, and you have them right in, at, at uh, New Brunswick. So um, it'll be easy to talk to somebody. So if you want to do mid-season, there are a lot of crops that once you plant them, you can plant them again. Um, in let's say you planted them in April and you want to get a second harvest, you plant them again in at uh, the end of June. And then by the time the frost comes, they'll all be ready again. Um, for example, even at my farm, we do sweet corn, we, we, we stagger it. So this way we have corn pretty much once it's mature, we have it to the end of the season to the first frost. So we'll plant a, a bunch of the corn and then we'll wait two weeks and plant another, wait two weeks and plant another. And you can do this with, with other crops very well, such as beets and carrots, carrots, plant some carrot seeds, wait a week or two and then plant some more. Same thing with cabbage, cabbage likes the cold, so that'll grow into the into the cold season, same thing with collards. Cucumbers too, you wanna to stagger them because you don't want all your cucumbers coming in at once because once they start coming in, they're gonna come in and you're gonna get a lot of them. Green beans, particularly uh, what we call uh, bush beans, they're, they're not climbers, they'll, they'll grow very well and you can keep planting. We do two or three plantings of, of those. Uh, spinach too, but I like what I do with spinach. I plant it in the spring and then I plant it again in August. So this way when the weather gets cold, because it really likes to, germinate in the cool weather. So there's a lot. So if you follow this guide here, and again, look this, you can look these things up online and you'll see for yourself that um, there's a lot more to it. I'm Again, I'm picking things that are the most popular. Um, then people ask me about a lot of times companion planting. And companion planting is um, a good idea. Um, it's very popular now. Um, but 
plants that like to grow near each other because their root systems support each other by the different types of gases they may exude. Some um, some uh, put off more nitrogen than others, and the other plants who likes the nitrogen, or even when they exude oxygen, some plants will need some of that oxygen, so they'll take it. So when when you companion plant, you don't have to plant them right on top of each other. Give a little space between them, but they, this again, it's a, I, it's, a, it's just a list of common vegetables. Um, <clears throat> so you can expand on that depending on what you like to grow. There's a companion plant for everything. But uh, you've heard the story of the sweet corn, plant the squash between the rows because it keeps the weeds down, plant the cucumbers because then they grow up the stalks and then you can pick uh, your cucumbers and your corn at the same time. So um, one year we planted these little miniature pumpkins right by the, on the border of our uh, corn patch. Our corn, about, we planted about an acre of corn. So it, it actually found its way in and after the corn had died, and we leave the stalks in uh, till the end, and then we would come up to the farm and see little orange pumpkins hanging from the corn stalks. So, and it was made them easy to pick because we could see them all, and they were not heavy, maybe a pound or two. So they were little pumpkins that they used for stuffing and putting soups in at restaurants. So we we had those as well. So um, that's companion planting. Then what we want to talk about is, uh, let's talk about now um, soil. So I'm going to talk about, now that we have, we've, we've talked about the different kinds of vegetables and the different kinds of ways of doing companion planting, mid-season starting. I like to talk about uh, um, pairing soil for your garden. And I'm going to use this here, uh, have this um, sheet here. When I had my garden in Nutley, I had four by eight foot boxes, four by eight by 10 inches high. And the soil there was very poor because it was mostly clay, it was Essex County. So what I had to do was start from scratch. So I kind of had to excavate everything out. I think where you are down in Pennington in that area, the soil is very good. You have some really nice farms there. Uh, so I don't think you'd have to start from scratch unless the soil has been really disturbed. My, in my case, the house was new and they had just put a little cosmetic topsoil on there. So to make us think it was really good. And when I went to dig the garden, it was maybe an inch of topsoil and the rest was just clay. So I came up with, um, by reading different, um, from different, talking to different gardeners and garden clubs and reading things online and reading things from the Ag Extension, I came up with a, uh, with a mixture to <clears throat> fill a, a four by eight by 10 inch raised bed with soil. And even now, it's not expensive to do this. The topsoils, uh, you can buy it by the bag, and I recommend that because it's easier to measure out if you're going to do it. Now, even though I put these in raised beds, you can just mix the soil. If you want to do an open bed, you don't have to make a, a, a form or, or, or a border on it. But I found that this mixture worked really well and helped me to start a good, uh, a top, a good soil area for growing. And what I did, I made a compost pile after that. So every year I would just add compost to my box from everything that I saved in the garden and table scraps, primarily vegetable table scraps, eggshells, uh, coffee grinds, coffee filters, things of that type. I didn't use any oils or greases or anything like that. Um, you don't want to mix that in with, with uh, any, any bones and, and things of that type either. It takes too long to degrade in the oils will actually do more harm to the soil than good. So <clears throat> once I had this re ready, I just filled the box. And then every year I just had to add a little compost. And the nice thing about res raised beds, which is my preferred method of gardening and also preferred for a victory garden, the raised beds are good with a, with a frame around them because you really eliminate any possibility of erosion, especially when it's stormy or bad weather, rainy, windy. So after you do all this hard work, a lot of that soil can wash away in certain conditions. So having them raised beds does a few things. It, it protects the soil from, from being washed out. It also elevates the garden, helping to keep some of the pests out. You can go higher. I went 10 inches, 12 inches is not uncommon. You don't have to bend down as far. It makes it easier to work, easier to manage. Um, and it looks very nice as an aesthetic. We'll, we'll show some pictures of that later. Um, also, when you, if you do do raised beds, I, you see this little piece of information at the bottom, board preservation mix. 
you don't want to use treated lumber. You want to use uh, chemically treated for rot. You don't want to use that. You want to use natural boards. My preference of boards are spruce, fir, and pine because those boards are light. Those boards are very porous and those boards are easy to work, uh, easy to cut and readily available and pretty cheap now. The lumber prices have really dropped. So what I like to do is I take a mixture of three parts of odorless mineral spirits and one part of boiled linseed oil and mix that together in an empty paint can. Then I apply two or three coats of it with a roller. Each coat is gonna soak in. The first coat will soak in the most, the next one a little less, and then the third one, when it stops soaking in, that's when you stop applying it. Let it dry, and that will last as long as a treated board without any, you won't have any residue, any chemicals, any anything to worry about in your food system. So that's what I would do with that. So now that we've talked about soil, and if most of you are probably gonna use the soil that's in your garden already, I would recommend uh, testing for the pH of the soil, especially if you haven't grown there before and you wanna make sure the soil is good. Um, pH, what does that mean? It means the, the, the acidity of the soil versus the alkalinity of the soil. So, but, and if you'll see everything that's green from number four to number nine, that's where the vegetables like to be. They like to be in that area um, in varying degrees. And if you look at the, the chart, you'll see that most of them are 5.5 to seven or five up to eight. Um, and that's where you want your, um, where you'd like it to be at. And this way you guarantee that most of your vegetables, with the, there are a few exceptions of some vegetables that like it a little bit more, a little more acid in the soil, some that like a little less. Um, but a good thing to do is to get, and I have one here, is a soil testing kit. And I'll give the link on this. This is readily available at um, on Amazon.com. I think it's $20. And the set is really good. Tests for four things. It tests for the nitrogen, phosphorus, potash, and the pH of the soil, each one having its own little test. Uh, what you do is you put some soil in, you put um, some water. They have color-coded tablets. You put a tablet and mix it together. Wherever it indicates the color it turns is going to indicate the, uh, the health of your soil for each aspect of it. So, uh, and, and then you can amend the soil properly by using um, a, a fertilizer if you need, if needs be. Um, again, with fertilizers, I don't recommend a miracle Grow. miracle Grow is fine for ornamentals, but I wouldn't grow, use it if I, for food. And I don't like what it, it's very detrimental to the soil. It uh, robs the soil of the natural vitamins and minerals that are in it and replaces it with synthetic ones. So it's a kind of like a drug fix. The more you put in, the more it wants. And then if you stop using it, the soil is, is neutral. There's nothing left. You have to build that soil up from scratch. Um, so it depletes everything out and replaces it with its own synthetic versions. So I would be very careful. Instead, I would go to, I have another slide here on fertilizing. I'm going to go to next. And I'll show you a couple of things on that. Um, See which one is this one? Yeah, here's a simple one. You can this I got from one of the ag extension um, sites. It's it's very uh, good. It's a homeowner's guide to fertilizer. Again, uh, you get a 10, 10, 10, and that only means that inside that bag it's 10% of, of of potash, nitrogen, and phosphate. So this is just a filler material. And what you do is you spread it in your garden uh, a little at a time until you get your pH uh, and your soil balance back to where it should be. A little goes a long way. So if you buy a five pound bag, it should last you many seasons. You know, you always add a little bit. You can always add more. You can't take it away once you put it out there. So be careful with it. Um, the, um, the second page uh, shows, uh, I think there's a second page yesterday. Um, how to apply it tells you different variations. So it's something you can read on your own. I do have a more extensive one, which I, I'll just show you. I won't go uh, in depth on it. But this one I got from the Washington State University, which was very good, um, from their Ag Extension Service in Spokane, Washington. And they have a nice guide on, the, uh, on for a fertilizer guide for the most common crops and even some fruit, I think, and how to use it, how to apply it, how to, what they call dressing. You, you dress it when you apply it. So it has its own term. 
Um, you can side dress it, which means you can put it alongside. You can put, just topically put it on. You can bury it with it. Um, so there are different, and each one, each crop has its own little, uh, it, it tells you how to, how to handle each one of these things. And it's very, very simple. How much to use, how far apart to put it. It's very, very good. Um, so now that we've done all that, where do we get our seeds from? So we're going to go to seed sources now. And I had mentioned this before. These are all great sources. Um, we work with Johnny's primarily for our farm. Um, and that was under the recommendation of Cornell University. And they were really right on the money. We've been working with Johnny since we started. I'd say 90%, 85 to 90% of seed we buy, we buy from them. We've never had a problem, never been disappointed. They do have a lot of customer support. Everybody who works there from the people who answer the phone to the people who actually ship out the, the seeds to know all about um, everything there is to know about growing. So most of them are farmers in, in the off season, uh, in the on season and off season, they work at Johnny's and Johnny's has a lot of troubleshooters they send out in the field for different, local, different areas of the country. And they're all really good people. And uh, the seeds there are, um, <clears throat> for all these suppliers here, the seeds will have, they do a germination test, test how many of the seed will germinate. So when, on the package, it'll tell you if it's a package of 100 seeds, it'll say something like maybe 95% of those seeds will come up because that's what you really want to have, a high germination rate because we live in a temperate zone. If there's a problem and you put your seeds in the ground and then a week or two later, they haven't come up yet because of some, they weren't germinated right or whatever, they were not there not a good uh, company or whatever, you wasted two weeks and we're in a temperate zone. Two weeks is a lot of time for us. We have a short season as it is. We're only really planting from March until October. So if you lose a few weeks, you lose a lot of time, particularly when you're farming. So you want to have things that are tried and true and you know they're going to work. And all these companies follow that. High mowing seeds, uh, Johnny's is in Maine. High mowing's I think in uh, Vermont. Uh, seed savers organization for all gardeners, I recommend that you, you, you get a seed savers catalog and all these catalogs are available on PDF. They will send you a hard copy if you request it. Um, seed savers is a great organization. They collect a lot of heritage and a lot of heirloom seeds from all over the world. And they have different, a lot of uh, unique varieties that you probably never heard of before that may go back generationally. They can trace the lineage of seeds in some cases for, for 500 years back to Europe, Asia, Africa, um, South America, and and they'll tell you where the lineage started and where it is when it came to the United States, and and we got people still cultivating these seeds and saving them for seed, and they're not expensive at all. A typical package of seeds from Seed Saver is about six dollars, and again, high germination rate. We use them for some of our heirloom tomatoes. I can't say enough about their tomatoes. Um, Fedco seeds is very good. They're in Maine also. They've been around a long time. Hudson Valley is right here, I think, at Poughkeepsie, a good seed company, relatively new. If you like to grow onions and scallions and shallots and garlic, uh, Dixondale Farms in Texas has all organic uh, seed, seed bulbs and um, seedlings. They'll sell you actually live. If you want to plant onions, you can buy actual live onion seedlings uh, from them. And they will uh, send you the live seedlings in a bundle of about 70 in a bundle. You can buy one bundle up to a box of 30. And it's where you plant the little seedlings in the ground. It's very nice. And then they come up quickly. Uh, starting onions from seeds, sometimes the conditions have to be pretty much on the money and otherwise they won't come up. Uh, so a little, but I, I like to start and leave it at the farm. We start with either bulbs or the seedlings. Most of the onion farmers in my area, because the, uh, the uh, Orange County, New York, with the black dirt region where we are, is heavily onions. One quarter of the onions grown in the United States is grown in Orange County, New York. So right now they're all putting out all these onions and they're doing it all by hand, all the little seedlings, miles and miles of them. And so it's really something to see. Um, Harris Seeds, very good, old company, been around for at least 150 years. Uh, if you want, like I was talking about the tools before, Nolts Produce Supplies is the, the number one place to go. They're in New Holland, Pennsylvania, and Amish country. You can, of course, order mail order with them, not a problem. Their catalogs online. They have everything that you would need for your garden, from tomato cages to tomato steaks, tomato twine. They have 
uh, bu buckets, baskets, um, whatever you need, tags, uh, rubber bands, anything, baskets, um, what do you call it, uh, pots, whatever you might need for your garden or farm, they have it. You want to do drip irrigation, they have it. Grower supplies in Connecticut, they tend to be more for a larger grower, but again, they have a good amount of similar product as, um, as Nulse does. So that's um, what I would do in that case. Yeah. And then there, and also you can always get yourself um, right, uh, books, a lot of books on, on gardening and farming out there. Uh, so don't be afraid to, to look at some of them are terrific. And I recommend, I have a list that I put together here. And even though some of it's about farming, but most of them really pertain to gardening. Anything by Elliot Coleman is very good. Elliot Coleman is one of the original uh, organic growers in the United States. He started in the 1960s. He's still alive, and he has the Four Season Farm in in Maine. So he operates a Four Season Farm that grows through the winter. He in a series of unheated greenhouses. He does it all. Um, there are a couple of good magazines, Countryside and Small Stock Journal. Very good. Uh, not only do they tell you how to grow, they tell you what to do with what you've grown, because that's the really the key. You want to show people like, you know, that are growing for, uh, for, for sustainability. So um, you can, you know, they tell you what to do, whether you jar, pan, preserve, uh, uh, dry, they tell you everything. And Backwoods Home Magazine is, is fantastic. It's a quarterly, and that's a good magazine too. Um, what you should do too is like every spring, I have this here, I'm not gonna go over it now, but. A spring preparation list is, is good. I got, I have received, I took this off one of the websites from, from the state and uh, from the Ag Extension. Things you want to do, read through this. I'll make this available to everybody. They're actually on my website. You can download them. Um, simple steps to keep your garden healthy and to keep it clean. Um, because one of the problems is if the garden is not clean, the soil suffers, it invites a lot of pests. And, and then you have a lot of, trouble after that. And of course, with preparation also comes um, garden maintenance. And so there's a nice document I have on that one too. So now what we should do, let's move to some different ideas on, now, now that we've talked about this, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about garden designs. And I did, I prepared a bunch of here. Uh, so you can go online yourself and go to pictures and look at uh, different types of, uh, Pictures about uh, gardening, oh, and there's so many that you can let me close that window. Uh, find uh, we're, we're going to discuss a few different types. We're going to do raised beds, open beds, uh, terrace grow gardening, pallet gardening, um, and uh, square foot gardening. It's the most common types. Uh, pallet gardening being the new kid on the block that uh, it's been it's all the rage now, growing in pallets, uh, and I will explain why. So I, what I did was I took a few historical pictures of um, Victory Garden. This is from World War I. What Uncle Sam says that we need to cut food costs and we need to grow our own food. You know, because um, they had the free bulletin on gardening and they were all about preparing and growing your own garden to, as I said, to relieve the pressure for, for the war effort. And I like that little headline there saying, free bulletin on gardening, it's food for thought. I like that. And the next one, Let's see where this one, what happened there, my pictures. Um, let's see, oh, just give me a second, I'm having a little technical difficulty here. Let's see, let me go set that with the pictures again. Just bear with me a second. Wait a second, we may have to do these individually. All right, here we go. And then at one point, Uncle Sam had, um, they wanted you to expect you to raise chickens during World War One, And I do a talk on raising hens. Uh, we do have hens at the farm for egg production. Uh, small, we're actually, we just ordered six more chicks from a, from a hatchery in Andover, New Jersey. And we'd be picking them up on uh, May 12th. They're gonna be born on May 9th. And we're picking them up when they're three or four days old. And we've done that before we bring them here. We have the heat lamp. And we keep them till it, uh, 12 weeks old and then we introduce them to the flock. And having a flock of chickens is an excellent, it's, 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 it's easier than taking care of a cat. It really is. It's, it's these animals take care of themselves. So as long as you keep them out of the wind 
and out of uh, uh, rain and have good shelter for them. You don't need to heat them. You just need to have enough water on hand, water and feed, and they'll be fine. And there's some area to forage in. So uh, even that during World War I, Uncle Sam was promoting um, everybody having a, <clears throat> um, a, a, a flock of chickens. So uh, let's see, let's go to the next one. Um, and they did add some nice posters. So here, here's another one, a poster of uh, during the, the United States School Guard and Army, because they were made, they were doing that in schools. And now it's becoming popular, school gardens now, trying to, so people eat healthier, kids eat healthier in, in, in schools. Um, and then let's see, and then World War II, it got a little more serious. The graphics got a little bit less fun. They, they, were, they were more, uh, you know, like hard hitting, like more because it was a more serious, I guess, time. So grow food in your garden or, or get an allotment. So they had that, and that was a very interesting that they did that. Uh, and the graphics changed. It's funny how the graphics changed from one war to the next, right? And here, like, plant the victory garden, our food is fighting. A garden will make your, your rations go further. We came up with the idea of the Victory Garden. Before then, our, we only had one talk, and that was just on um, the farm methods to a backyard garden. Then, when when COVID came along, we people were asking. They were worried. They were asking me, "How do I grow my own food? How do I? I'm worried about the food chain, the supply chain." And so we came up with the idea of the Victory Garden, which is really just an adapt, adaptation of the backyard garden. And from there, we we did it. We, we went to another talk on small space for people who don't have. A backyard they only have a, a, a veranda or a um, or they have a balcony or they have a deck you know so we came up with that and that's another talk so that's for another day so a first garden plan i'm going to show is this one here you know let's get this one going okay this is your most bare, basic bare bones one it's just an open plan it's a raised bed yes but the problem with this one is it's very rudimentary they're using here to plant peas looks like snow peas um, that's why all the trellises are there. But as you can see, there's nothing holding that soil back. And that's nice soil. And uh, what's going to happen eventually to that soil is if there's a rainstorm or a hurricane or some severe weather, uh, even melting snow, it's going to, a lot of that soil is going to be lost because there's nothing there to anchor it. And even if they had something between the rows like hay or straw or grass clippings, that would at least hold the soil somewhat there. But this is this is when you're on, I guess, a real tight budget and it's really bare bones. And um, that's, you know, if you're really not going to keep the garden in one spot long, then that's the way to go. Um, the next one is this one. Sorry, I have to open it one by one. I'm having a little trouble with this picture viewer. So this, again, is, a, is an open plan, but this one's a little bit more organized. This one, they have a little bit of fencing on the outside. It's not really going to keep deer out, but it may keep your rabbit out or uh, groundhog, but it's not going to keep anything that can climb um, or can step over like a deer. Um, but they did everything in rows, which is nice. And they use looks like grass clippings or hay. You can buy a hay bale still for four or five dollars, five, six dollars a hay bale. And you spread the hay out if you don't want to spend any money putting, like, say, um, uh, wood chips or pebbles or whatever in between. You want to keep it easy. This is the way to go, because what happened, the nice thing about this is when the season's over, everything that's in that garden, you can just let it die, let it collapse, grind it up, and then turn it all into the soil. And you'll just be reintroducing all that organic matter in the soil in the top area. So even this, hey, just turn everything over and then start again. Um, get yourself a little rototiller or a rent one. That would be the way, best way to go. You only go down about four to six inches, you don't have to go down like um, like a plow where you go down more than a foot, which which really destroys the soil. Um, that's another talk too, uh, you know, low till versus no till versus complete till. There's a lot of different, <clears throat> there's a lot of different thoughts on that uh, situation, but that's this way. Um, my preferred one is raised beds. And this is nice. This is a, a classic picture of what a raised bed should look like. Um, it's the it's nice, it's neat. You can get in between the rows with wagons. So when you want to bring your harvest out, you can also bring tools and and maybe in a chair or or something to sit on. It gives you room to work around. They're all built up. Uh, you can even put anchor some weed block material 
you can put these have drip systems in them, which is very nice. And you see those white pipes, those are not there just for braces. They're there to hold row covers up. You put some bendable conduit and you can throw some polyethylene over as, um, and have yourself a little greenhouse in the off season. So when you're starting early or you're starting or you want to run late, you can protect your, your, your crops um, that way. So it does, uh, uh, it's very versatile. Very clean and it also looks very nice. Let me have the next one. It's another raised, uh, raised beds can be in, as ornate as you want them to be. This one's nice because they can actually, these ones, they have the small stones in between and they have uh, some pavers. It's what you want to do aesthetically. They even have some thatch for fencing. It's what it, it, it's, it's like your own palette. You can just make it whatever you want it to be. These are nice and high off the ground, easy to cultivate. Um, they are, looks like they use old railroad ties or posts to do them. Um, again, that's more of a permanent situation, <clears throat> a little bit more costly to build, but very, very permanent. So that's it. That's a very, it was very aesthetically, a very aesthetic look. The next one we have here, this is even more polished. Now, the thing too is you can go higher. If you don't really want to bend down, you really can go up higher, but there's a, it works against you too, because sometimes you may have to climb in there to turn the soil over to work it. So uh, you have to keep that in mind too. And also, because you're going deeper, you, you will have to add more soil, but there's a way around that. If you're not growing things that the root systems go any deeper than six inches, you could actually fill the bottom layer with wood scraps, branches, trunks, uh, you know, backyard debris, uh, leaves, things like that, rather than waste all that soil down below where the roots aren't really gonna go unless you're growing carrots and beets and things of that type. So and daikon radishes and roots go very deep. Again, and this has a nice fence on the outside. Um, let's go to the next one. Yeah, this one's really nice. I like this one it has um, real nice deer fencing all around it. Uh, and they did a central thing where they have like a center area and then they have their garden boxes radiate out. Um, so that's a very nice uh, look too. Looks like they have little uh, bins on the side for composting. So it's a nice little self-contained uh, garden area protected from pests. Um, you can, and you, there's no reason why in your garden, you can't do a combination of, of growing um, uh, vegetables and fruit and ornamentals like in this garden, for example, raised beds. And they put um, a border of marigolds. The marigolds are a good pest repellent particularly bugs and insects and beetles and things that like to eat leaves. So, so the marigolds kind of form a barrier uh, between that. Uh, so, and it looks nice too. So you can add that uh, in your boxes. You don't want to put too many because you really, especially if you're limited where you're growing, you want to maximize, the whole idea is to maximize the box. Uh, also rotate your crops every year because if there are certain pests that like to attack certain plants, um, the larvae would be will be there. So you want to make sure when the plant comes the next year, the plant is not there, so the larvae die because there's nothing for them to eat. Um, pepper plants and uh, 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 rarely have any um, any pests at all that like to eat the leaves. Uh, eggplant, uh, potato beetles will go after eggplant. Tomatoes are pretty much impervious to everything, nothing except the hookworm, but uh, caterpillar, but that's not that often. Um, and so we uh, you rarely have to use anything to, uh, if you do have to use an insecticide, uh, use a natural one. There's one we use at the farm called Monterey Garden Spray, and that's all organic, made out of a fungus, a spinosad fungus. And uh, so it's completely safe. Um, it will not uh, harm you if you ingest it. Um, and it's very good. It's a broad spectrum of, of, of insect killer and uh, deterrent. So this one's a nice garden too. I like the way they have the climbing beans. They made all these little trellises. So again, you're only limited by your imagination. You can do whatever you want. Um, then, then we have people who do not have a level yard. So you maximize, you, you, there's no reason why you can't have a garden. This one, again, I, I go from rudimentary to more involved. This is your basic bare bones. Uh, um, garden. They're using everything from wine bottles to thatch to keep their rows contained. And it does the job, you know. Um, so you, and, and you can step down, you leave an area to walk. 
make little little pathways for yourself. You want to do something like they have a combination here of boards, bottles, and thatch to hold the soil back and washouts. And again, it can, you can go as many steps as you want, depending on how how, how long your slope is or how slope it, it is. Then you have more involved ones, like this one is a very permanent one, which is part of the landscaping. Uh, I like this one for a few reasons. One, it's very aesthetic. And number two, it's really pest proof. Uh, a lot of the a lot of uh, pests like groundhogs, rabbits, and, and deer are not going to come up and go into those rows uh, because they'll feel threatened. They will not. They, uh, animals like that, those need an escape route. They have to be able to get away from a predator, and being trapped in between a small row like that, they're not going to do it. Uh, maybe the outside row they might nibble between the, the chicken wire. Um, the only thing I would may have to add on something like this is a little bird netting, but. Birds aren't always a problem, you know, so, but chicken wire will do the trick, especially on something like this, will keep most of the pests away. And I like the way they have a combination of pavers and the wood, the wood, it's a, it's a nice look. Um, let's go some more. This one they utilized, they put a garden in between some steps, which I thought was really nice. They had a set of stairs and then they said, you know what, we can put in a couple of raised beds going up. Um, you don't want to go too wide because you have to be able to work that. You have to be able to reach it, uh, you know, especially from the other side here. I don't know if there's another set of stairs, but, you know, you have to be able to, you know, it can't only look good. It's got to be easily available to, to, work, uh, to work with. Um, um, then we have another terraced one here. This one, I, the only problem with this one, and I, sometimes I pick things not because they're perfect, but because I can tell you what's wrong with it. There's no way to access each bed on the right side of the picture without actually stepping in the bed. They didn't leave paths. They left a nice wide walkway down the middle, but they didn't leave a little path to go to each box. So now you have to step on the soil to get to the box above it. And what you're doing is you're compressing the soil and you're, you know, putting the soil under stress by doing that. Um, so that's the only detriment I see with, with this one. But the idea is good. Had they left a little area to walk, it'd be great. Um, and here's another terrace. I picked this one to show a terrace under construction. Um, so this way you say, oh, look, my yard is sloping, but I'm keeping everything nice and level just by using these, um, these uh, four by fours or six by sixes or six by fours, I think they are. But again, uh, hopefully they will make a little pathway on each one of those boxes so that this way they don't step on the soil while they're doing it. Um, but again, you can see that's under construction, so that's a good one to show. And our last terrace one is this one. This one's very nice to see. They left the paths with the straw in between each row, so it's accessible. They have like a grass, a nice grass a path to go and make this bigger. They have a nice grass path to go down. It looks like they have an area with hoops that they can protect in the winter to. They have their hose down the way there. So you always want to have your water source. You want to have a compost pile. You want to have everything at the ready. So it, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to rush and do things. It's, it's all organized. Organizing really helps to have a good garden. You want to be organized. Then we have a square foot gardening. In fact, there used to be a TV show about square foot gardening. Essentially, it's the same thing as raised beds, except it helps people plan out what they want to grow. Uh, in, in specific, because plants have to be specifically, some of them need to be a certain distance apart from each other to get the maximum yield. Now, this one I picked because this is a bad example of a square foot garden, because everything's growing into everything. Why would you even bother? I mean, you have, there's no rhyme or reason here. It's just one big mess. And they're just growing all over the place. They didn't adhere to what the whole idea of square foot gardening is. But then we have the next one, which shows it completely organized. There you go, that's square foot gardening. So you have pe pe pepper plants and those pepper plants are each one foot away from each other if you plant them in the center. And this way they're gonna grow up straight, they're self-supporting. There'll be plenty of air between each of them so they can all get sunlight. Um, and then some the other ones they put, looks like basil and parsley are in between and one tomato plant. Um, uh, so you can do that too. See uh, here, they have a tomato plant there, they have uh, basil there. So as long as you keep it contained in that, in the uh, in the squares. Some people just use cord. 
Some people make it more decorative by using the wood in between. I think it's it's nice with the wood. And here's another one on the construction. Again, it really looks like very aesthetic and, and uh, it just makes for the ambiance, it just makes it nicer. Um, then you have um, palette. We've talked about palette gardening. Palette gardening is very popular. You, and palettes are very inexpensive. You can get them pretty much free. Uh, if you go to a tile place, they usually have them out front, take one or take all. If you go to a garden center, a lot of their plants and their trees and shrubs are delivered on pallets. So they have loads of them and they'll usually sell them to you to about $5 a, a pallet. And they're all in good shape. Uh, the ones that I've picked up anyway, we use them in the greenhouse sometimes. Um, they're nice, you can, uh, you can apply that coating that I talked about on there. The only thing with pallets is they are open on the sides. You'd probably have to put a board on each side just to contain the soil. The bottom, I would just leave open. This way the water can go out and goes into the soil underneath. The nice thing about the pallet is you have a built-in weed block between each row. So you only have to contend with weeds where the plants are. And if you plant the plants um, close enough together, as in this instance, your weed problem is going to be minimal. Uh, well, let's see what we have here. Here's another pallet garden. This is all lettuces, and this needs to be picked really bad. They let it grow, they grow. But the nice thing about lettuces like this, they'll all come back. And they have all different types of lettuce here. They have uh, romaine, looks like they have bib lettuce, curly lettuce, uh, red oak leaf lettuce. Um, so uh, it's very, people like lettuce. Uh, so, But it, it works. You can see again, they put tar paper as a little bit of, I guess, a barrier for the weather. But if you use the coating, you don't have to do that. Um, I, you know, I, I found some new ones. Um, this is a, a ideal. This one it lends itself to strawberries. Strawberries grow very well in pallets. They don't have a deep root system. And you plant a strawberry every foot and a half apart because they will send out feelers and you can plant them next to each other. Once they take root, you could cut them from the mother plant. Um, uh, um, strawberries grow for about five years. They produce heavily, then they stop, and then you have to re replant them again. But if you keep the rotation going of the feelers that come off, um, uh, uh, and you'll constantly be replenishing the plants, and you won't have to worry about replanting from scratch. Um, and then we have, here's another one. Um, again, this is in the beginnings. They have one row of marigolds. They don't have much planting in it yet, but you can see you can, do, you can put uh, tomatoes in, you can put pepper plants in, uh, put lettuce in, you can do whatever you want. And, and, you, and you can lay them out in a modular, so you can lay them out uh, there uh, next to each other, perpendicular to each other, whatever. You, it's, only, it's up to you. Some people even use them vertically and put a bottom on each piece and then they have shelving. Uh, some people just use them to hang pots on. Um, this is all types of onions and shallots, uh, no, onions and uh, scallions. You can see that, some herbs, um, but, but this is a nice one too. Um, so there, that's those. Then we have, uh, as we were talking about row covers before, I brought a sample. This is inside our greenhouse. We have, um, we're redoing our greenhouse now. We have uh, 16 raised beds in there and each one is four foot wide by 16 foot long. And we grow uh, lettuces and we grow um, spinach, um, sorrel, all different types of hardy crops in there in the winter and in the fall. Um, and we put row covers to give it an extra layer of protection because it's an unheated greenhouse. There's a material called Agribond, A-G-R-I-B-O-N-D, that you can buy small rolls, any size you want. It'll help keep the plants under it at least six degrees warmer than if it was exposed to the out, uh, the air. So example, if you're they're outside and it's good, there's going to be a frost and you just put those plants out, you say, oh, what am I going to do now? Get yourself a little agribond. It'll keep it above freezing, protect the plants, and um, you can store it. it. It lasts for years. And um, this just, a, I brought a couple of samples of my garden. Um, and this is when I had my garden in Nutley, New Jersey. And uh, I was lucky it was kind of elevated off the uh, off the ground, so I didn't really have any problem with 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 um, you know varmints coming in and bothering my garden. So, but I did four by eight, ten inches high, and I, that's my soil that I had built up. And I put those. Um, there was a lot of sandstone on the property, so I put the sandstone in between each 
um, each box. But before that, I had grass, and I would just leave it the width of the mower so I could just go down with the mower down each row. Um, but then I said, oh, I have all the sandstone. Let me build a little kind of Appian lay in there, you know. So and then each box was for the specific thing. The, the end box, the longer, was herbs. Then the next one's lettuce. All types of beans. The next one. Next one was four pepper plants and a zucchini plant. Because um, you want to organize everything. You want to like maximize your space. And we got enough out of this garden to feed the whole neighborhood. And then I had some uh, my onions over by the fence. And next to I have a stand of corn. And I had more peppers. And I had an eggplant in the other one. So that's how I planned it. And there's my compost pile was there. So that's uh, what we, we, that's how we did it. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Uh, let's see if I can do this. Uh, stop share. Okay, let's go back. Let's go back to where we were. Okay, great. Um, now, if I have time for to show a few minutes of tools, or is that okay? Do we have time? Uh, we do. We also have a couple of questions. Yeah, we can answer um, some questions. I can show a little bit of the tools. I do have a few things I want to show. We'll take a look. Okay. Uh, do you want to do that first or go through the yeah, questions? We can do questions and then you'll break it up a little okay. bit. Okay. Sounds good. So one of the questions that we had in the beginning when you were um, explaining how to kind of get your soil ready, um, you included peat moss as um, something to put into that mix. And um, someone was wondering what are the alternatives to peat moss? If, you know, a lot of people have concerns about like the sustainability of using peat moss. Um, do you have any alternatives that you might suggest? Um, just compost. Use compost then. That's it. Your own compost. Peat moss, they worry about the sustainability, but the peat moss bogs in Canada are really well managed. They're not just where they take them out and they just destroy all these acres of it. They, I think they used to do a lot of that in England, but Canada, uh, I think they are, it's like a renewable. They just let them build up again. And, uh, um, and the peat moss from Canada is really, really, really nutrient dense. It's very good. So and you're not using that much. Once you use it, you don't have to use it every year. So you're not really, you're buying three cubic feet. I mean, that's enough for each box. And that's enough for a long time. You can start to replace that with compost so you don't rely heavily on it, you know. Okay. Um, another question we have here is, it says, I have two kale plants that wintered over and grew into big plants. They are in yellow bloom. Do I keep them or cut them back? I would, I would start to cut them back, especially if they're getting that big. Yes, cut them back and they're coming, keep coming uh, nicer. What, what happens with kale when it overwinters, it's known as savory kale because it becomes actually sweeter. So, and that becomes actually more in demand. People like the savory kale, it has more of a nice sweet taste to it when you cook it. But definitely cut it back, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and then our last question that we have so, for, so far, and everyone can um, feel free to add questions in the Q&A and we can come back to those later, um, is what veggies are good in pots or containers to save water? And this is from a person in Cape May County. Cape May County, yeah. Um, veggies in pots, can they save water? Well, you know, a lot of the thing about vegetables is they all need water because they're producing vegetables and what vegetables are 90% water, especially corn, but the tomatoes too, peppers, uh, they're a lot of water. So what you have to do, if you buy yourself a nice, I would just get myself a pot that's bigger, at least a 12 inch uh, diameter pot and at least a foot deep. So the root system can go down, make sure this holes in it's well drained. Um, and put some rock in the bottom too. So this way it, it'll hold some of the moisture. So you don't have to water every day. Um, that's it. And then maybe put a layer of uh, straw or, or hay on top to contain the water in. You don't want to keep things too wet because uh, you'll, you'll invite mold and, and mildew and uh, all types of blight. So, so you want to keep a, a balance, you know? So I would recommend don't go, some people go with a, a planter that's too big and they wind up wasting a lot of water. A comfortable size plant would be something 10 to 12 inches in diameter by a foot, about a foot deep. And that would be enough. Most of the root systems only go down about six inches. So uh, some people put everything in five gallon pails and they wind up filling that pail with water. So and not only they're doing two things, they're wasting water and they're also, they're, they're, they're destroying the plant. The plant never dries out, never has a chance to recover. So you can overwater too. 
All right, well, that is, that's the last question that was in the Q&A. So maybe now we can switch over to looking at the tools for a few yeah. minutes. And then if anybody has questions that you know, come up, just put them in the Q&A and we'll address sure. them. Um, one of the things I, I, I like to talk about is there's a tool that my wife found this online called Clyde's Garden Planner. Let me hold that up there so everybody can see it. Okay, Clyde's Garden Planner. It's a great, it's a slide rule for gardeners. For seven dollars, you buy it right from Clyde, or you can get it on on Amazon.com. I'll give Kristen the link. You go to Clyde's website; it has a little video on how it works. It's a very simple tool. You have this. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. There's a red line. The red line you line up. It works in any zone. The red line you line it up with any with your last frost date. And I think probably the frost date in in Pennington area, in Mercer County, is probably going to be around May 14th. So I line it up with May 14th, then I look at the, the vegetable lists on my left side, and I say, okay, when do I plant my carrots? And it'll say, oh, if I line this up correctly, I should plant my first carrots on May 3rd. When will I get my first uh, carrots? I'll get my first carrots on July 19th. And this is all, you know, it's it's close, but it's not exact. But it gives you a ballpark of when things when to plant things, when you're going to harvest them. Also has a great area of uh, companion plantings. It tells you which plants work together, where to plant, how far apart to plant your rows, how far apart to plant your 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 plants, your individual plants, and then you flip it over and you work as the fall side. So the fall side, you work backwards. You work from your fur, your your frost date back. And so it it is for both spring and fall planting. It's a great tool. Some of the, the, I was talking about the um, the tools that planters, particularly planters, a lot of times people are concerned about, um, <clears throat> what do you call it, um, like bending down, you know, because let's face it, a lot of times gardeners are not in they're a different age category. A lot of young people, and it's unfortunate, it seems to be getting better, but a lot of young people are not interested in gardening um, as much as they should be, and I see it all the time. Even a lot of times the people, we get volunteers to come to work and, and these people are, are well into their 40s and 50s who come and help at the farm. It's hard to get young people to do it. Um, but uh, so if you want to save your back while you're planting, I do have a great tool. Um, this one's called the uh, standing, standing Plant Cedar. I'll hold it up so you can see the name. And uh, it's made by a, a farmer out near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, his name is Frank Oliver, and he makes in the winter when he's not farming, because it's very severe winters in Mayor Pittsburgh, he builds these tools and then he sells them. And he holds the patent on two of them. And uh, he was nice enough a few years ago when he, I was telling him I do the talks, he sent me a couple of them. And what does this do? Well, if you see, if you look at this end here, the, it, when I squeeze it, I squeeze the hand, I'll show you the handle in a second, I squeeze it, it opens a little door. I'm squeezing this little handle here. So what I do, and it has a top. Okay, so what I do, I'm gonna step back a little bit so you can see. I jab it into the ground, I drop the seed in, I open the little door and I look straight up, it's planted. So what I do is I just get a little bag of seeds with me and I, I make it like a rhythm and I just plant and I work. And I plant so you don't have to bend down from putting my peas, my beans, my corn, uh, even bunches of uh, things. If you want to put like a bunch of lettuce, you can drop little bunches in. Radishes are great because radishes, you get a crop every two weeks. And the nice thing about radishes is you throw about a little pinch of seeds in, in about two weeks, the whole bunch is there. So you just pull the whole bunch out. So, so you can use this for all types. So you can use this for onion seedlings too, for tiny onion and garlic seedlings. You can throw, they, they will plant with this too. And if you go to his, I'll give you the link for his website. He shows you how to use it. So we use this one a lot for when we're doing a lot of linear stuff with beans and peas and, and cucumbers and um, things of that type that the seeds are not too small. But I say, even if you do use tiny seeds like lettuce seeds or, or radish seeds, you can just uh, pinch and drop down a, a little bit. He also makes a, a larger version that we call a transplanter. And this one, I'll show at the end, I'll show a little video on it, um, of my son doing uh, transplanting tomatoes. This is the bigger version. It's made out of steel and wire. Again, the end opens up and you can see it's well worn on the end. This is the drawer that opens up. 
This is the end where you drop the plant. So what you do is you jab it in the ground. You drop your tomato, your eggplant, your, your zucchini, or your pepper seedling. You buy a little set of six or set of four. You drop it in, open the door, lift straight up, and go to the next one. It's planted. So and this one's called the stand-in plant planter. And this is great if you're planting flowers and you want to like do a, like a bed of flowers, and you're trying to get a pattern going. A lot of times when you're doing it with by hand and you're down in the dirt, you're doing it down there. You're not really getting a sense of how it's going to look. You have to keep getting up and standing back to see if the circle is good or if I'm making some sort of pattern. With this thing, you can do it while you're standing up. I had a friend of mine, he was planting all flowers around his um, a statue and, and on his property. And I said, he was down there in the dirt on his knees on a canoe thing, you know, just one of those pads. And I said, what are you doing? I said, you should be using, I, so I brought it over and he was like, he bought one. He said, it's the greatest thing. I can see what, what I'm doing without bending down and the plants are planted. Uh, so it's a great tool. We use these at the farm, we have a few of them. So when we plant uh, our tomatoes, our peppers, our eggplant and our, um, our um, zucchini plants, we use this, they go right through. It's a three inch hole, boom, right down and it's great. And, and you don't have to hurt your back or bend down doing it. Uh, so that's how we, we do that at the farm. Another tool that I recommend that everybody have for weed control is a stirrup hoe. It looks like, a, well, is it stirrup? It's kind of like a stirrup on your hand you know, for your horsey ride. You know, you have a stirrup. So and this thing is nice because you can scrape the weeds through the soil without really disturbing the soil and lifting it. And yet you can cut the weed root and then lift it out. So a good stirrup, they come in different sizes. This is a five inch, you can get three inch, you can get six inch. This we use in our <coughs> raised beds in the greenhouse. A great tool. We did have another question pop up. Sure. Um, are away. you are you able to use the preservation mix so that you were recommending that we um, coat the wood um, mm -hmm. on a raised bed? Are you able to use that mix to coat bee boxes as well? Oh yes, because once it dries, it's dry and it's linseed oil. It's it's natural. It's not gonna um, the, the 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 mineral spirits that we use. We use this. Uh, I like to get the mineral spirits from that's made from alcohol based, not petro, petro, petroleum based, okay? Because that's gonna leave a little odor and maybe the bees won't like that. But if you get alcohol, the alcohol will dissipate. So uh, so you get like a green alcohol, um, a wood alcohol version, and then you buy the, you mix it with the linseed oil. But once it dries, it won't, that, the bees will not be affected at all. There wouldn't be a problem. I just have one more uh, tool to show. Um, a good, uh, the most important thing too in the garden is to have a good hoe. And, you know, those holes that they sell like in Home Depot and there's these big gigantic half moon things like they're too big. You wanna get something that's no bigger than this, you know, it does two things, two, three things actually. You can scrape the soil, chop the soil, and you can also use it as a plow to make a furrow to drop your seeds in. And the nice thing about a, a tool like this is it's modular. If the blade breaks or needs sharpening, you can remove it. You don't have to buy the whole tool. A lot of these tools that you get in the box stores are all riveted together. And then you wind up buying the whole tool because a little part of it broke because you can't take it apart. But all these are all screwed together in three or four pieces. You know, the handles are all made out of oak. And I recommend you, you um, coat your... Um, with your handles with mineral oil, and then they'll last for a long time. So that's what we have for tools tonight. So if I have any more questions, I'd be happy to, whatever I can help. All right, does anybody have any other questions? I know we're a little over our time here, but that was so much information. All I know. <laughs> um, and I will be sure, as I said in the chat, I will be sure to um, forward all of those handouts um, in an email sometime later this week for everybody. Um, I don't think we have any more questions. So let me just thank you um, for coming everyone. And thank you, Anthony, for joining us and sharing all of the information.
Um, before we go, I do just want to let everyone know about some things that are happening at the library um, coming up. So upcoming programs for families, we have our weekly outdoor story time every Wednesday at 11, um, outdoor or indoor, depending on the weather. And then we have a sailboats and story stroll program that's coming up in June. Um, and adults, you all can look forward to, uh, we have a ton of programs, so please do check our website. Um, but some programs include one on exciting discoveries in art history. We have a Zoom cooking class on relaxed seasonal dining. Um, and we actually have a farm tour at our local farm, Chickadee Creek Farm, um, and a Q&A session that's also coming up in May as part of Hopewell Valley Heritage Week. So as you can see, we're really busy too. So just check out our website so you can all of the details on that. Um, I just see one more question in the chat. Sure. Let me just look and make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay, it says, is it a, uh, could you recommend a link or source for the last hoe with the replaceable blade? So if oh, yes, you, I will. Okay, yes. mm -hmm. if you just want to forward that to me, um, mm -hmm. I can provide all of the links. Yes, I'll send everything from Clyde's. Uh, people love the Clyde's because they just, it, it's such a great tool. And, and he's a character when you go to his website, it's really funny. But, um, and he, he it's a nice thing for fundraisers too. If people want to, he'll put your logo on there. So, and you can use it as a, a garden fundraiser if you have a garden club. Uh, it's a great uh, tool. And, and I think he, he does it by packs of 50 or 100 and you get a better deal when you buy them, so. But uh, that you know can be done. But I just have one. I like to show it in the talks, and people really, really like it. Um, and yes, the tools there. I'll send the link for everything that we talked about tonight. The stand and plants in particular. People really buy those, especially the older people. They like, oh, this is great. I don't have to bend down when I plant my beans. <laughs> so it's, it's it works out really well, you know. All right. Well, thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Anthony, thank you so much for thank you. sharing all your knowledge. We loved having you back. Um, I love being right. back. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everyone, enjoy the rest of your night. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Thank I you. really appreciate it. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Good night. Good night.